energetically, when women engage in more feminine communication, including in marketing, it's more effective. When men engage in more masculine communication in their marketing, it's more effective. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And today I had the fabulous pleasure of speaking with my dear friend, Jamie Sarah, who is the founder of Definitely Definitely and the creator of the Aligned Business Blueprint and the author of The Six Types of Content to Captivate and Convert. So Jamie, she's been on the show uh, a few years ago now, uh, and really what she does is help service-based experts and professionals and service companies to attract, convert, and retain more high-caliber clients and to do this with the utmost of integrity. And the way that Jamie approaches this is um, very much like business of architecture is a holistic approach. And she helps them become much more deeply aligned with their brand messaging, their offerings, and actually use their energy. And when we use the word energy, we're talking about a blend of psychology and marketing expertise, which Jamie has honed over the last 20 plus years to really create messaging that attracts the ideal type of clientele that you're looking for in your business. Jamie is the host of the Jamie Sarah Show podcast. She's been featured in Forbes, Thrive Global, The Express, and many more. She was named Executive Coach of the Year in the UK for three years running. And in this conversation, we go deep. Some perhaps controversial ideas. I'm very interested to hear your um, take on some of this, but Nonetheless, very fascinating and very powerful. We talk about gender energies in selling and marketing communication and what happens when those don't align with the brand and the image that you're portraying. How to harness, we speak about how to harness your messaging to repel needy nightmare clients and to attract those heavenly ones. And we also look at the effective and ethical use of polarity, of creating polarity, creating tension in your messaging. So sit back, relax and enjoy Jamie Sarah. Special announcement to all Business of Architecture UK listeners. First of all, a massive, massive thank you for everybody who's been listening right from the beginning, who's been listening from last month or however long it has been since you found Business of Architecture UK, the podcast. We kicked this off at the beginning of 2018, um, six years ago, and it's been an incredible journey. And we're going to continue this journey. However, a slight change that we're going to make is that we're going to merge with our sister channel, Business of Architecture, which some of you are probably already listeners to. Um, myself and Enoch, we both... Um, record and present episodes there on that channel on that particular channel there's a lot of u.s based firm practices a lot of practices from all other parts of the world and we've decided that it's going to be a, a, a much easier listening audio experience to have the business of architecture uk and the business of architecture merge together so all of these fantastic interviews are in the same place for you to be able to browse through and to collate and to listen to so once again, thank you so much for listening to the Business of Architecture. We're not disappearing. We're just moving over and merging to our sister channel, Business of Architecture. So make sure that you subscribe over there. We'll be doing that at the beginning of 2024. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Jamie, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. I'm excited to be here with you again after a I little, know. Uh, it's been pause. a little while. 2018, <laughs> I think, or 2019, last time you were on the show. But you're a dear friend. We've known each other for a long time. And it's always an absolute pleasure to be able to spend time with you and pick your brain about all the enormous amount of marketing expertise and coaching expertise that you have. Um, you run your your own business. You your, You've got marketing at your very core and also like performance coaching and you work with a lot of um you know high net worth entrepreneurs helping them take their businesses to the next level and you've had a real kind of very impressive resume and cv of 
of experience of you know of helping businesses go from good to great to even better um so very excited to be sitting with you and discussing a very interesting topic kind of picking into some of your marketing prowess here and talking about polarity in messaging so do I, do, we, do do you need to do you want to explain a little bit in your own words what it is that you do um and then we can jump into that topic yeah for sure so i'm an executive coach and marketing consultant so like you said i coach entrepreneurs on their performance um, which includes their mindset includes how they're showing up for their clients how they're engaging with any challenges how they're communicating in difficult circumstances things like not avoiding difficult conversations having them head on and knowing exactly what to say so my marketing expertise actually comes in really really handy because marketing is all about how to express and articulate what you want to express and articulate clearly my marketing expertise actually comes in really handy with helping clients navigate difficult conversations as well because it's the exact same thing it's knowing how to communicate clearly what you want to communicate in a way that's going to land with who the person you're wanting to communicate with or the company that you want to communicate that's with. so interesting that you that you say that that the you know the sales process or the kind of conversational aspect of a selling conversation and by by extension the marketing conversation that precedes it you know that is a leadership conversation for influencing outcomes and is you know it is useful everywhere not and you know everywhere in your business with your team yeah. uh, you know even with intimate relationships and i know Completely. you know both of us we when we were trained in our personal development programs that we did together um you know again that kind of idea of the power of of conversation both in a sales context marketing context and leadership context yeah. you know they are one and the same that's a, that's a really that's a very deep insight Definitely. And I think also, you know, when we look at your brand and, you know, the other pieces is, is directly helping clients with their marketing, with their sales process, making sure that everything's really clearly articulated. Things like your onboarding process are clear, your messaging's really clear, um, your each of your individual offerings or packages are um, clearly defined, clearly differentiated. There's clear boundaries around them. And it's really, really important and it really helps to preserve your sanity as a business owner, but also when everything's really clear for your customers, massively enhances the brand experience, which means we're likely to stay around for longer. They're likely to make referrals. They're likely to become raving fans. They'll leave great reviews, all these kinds of things that impact the longevity of your brand. Mm -hmm. So so before we go into like what polarity is in messaging and the other extension of that conversation, mm -hmm. um, what what are some of the problems then that you see a lot of business owners facing? And I'm sure like a lot of our architectural audience are going to be able to relate to, to, to some of these. What, when, when someone, when you first start working with a, with a company, what, what's some of the issues that you'll see they have with their existing brand and their existing message that they're putting out to the world? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things is that normally they're overcomplicating how they talk about what they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So they're using overly technical language or they're using their language versus their ideal client's language, mm -hmm. or they're providing too much information. They don't have a clear and concise elevator pitch that mm -hmm. speaks to the hearts, minds, and souls of their ideal client. Um, and that's, yeah. that's the biggest thing. Um, also often, uh, they're not making it easy enough for people to pay them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, it's really important to make it as easy as possible for the right people, and that's an important caveat, the right people mm -hmm. to pay you. Mm -hmm. um, things like payment links, whether it's payment links for passive products, right? Not everything needs to involve you for anything that doesn't involve your live time and effort. Why would you not have you know, immediate payment links for people to buy? Mm -hmm. um, they also often, uh, when people start working with me, their offerings are much narrower. So they'll have, you know, one-to-one -one or, or trading time for money type offerings. And they don't have passive products. They don't have scalable products. They don't have scalable offerings. And whatever your business is, there is a way to create passive products and scalable products, scalable offerings, um, where you can be impacting many different potential customers at once. Of course, if you're impacting many at once, it's not going to be the same as 
any kind of one to one offering or any kind of um, directly trading time for money offering. But that doesn't mean that it can't be really, really impactful and mm -hmm. it can't deeply serve those people. And so often as well, there's a little bit of mindset stuff where it's like, you know, but I don't want to launch a passive product because um, if I do that, people aren't going to get what they need. Like I can't turn my expertise into a passive product. They people need me. Right. Which is sometimes it's a combination of ego mm -hmm. and just fear of the unknown. Yeah. And so I will help them design a, a value ladder. That's what mm -hmm. we call in marketing a value ladder where people can buy something from your company wherever they're at. Starting mm -hmm. with, so my uh, cheapest, most accessible um, product is my book. Mm -hmm. So that goes at the bottom of my value ladder. And then with each step, they're investing more, they're getting more. But wherever they're at, there's going to be something for them. And that means yeah. that you can help a wider um, segment of the market while still being very, very clear who your target audience is. Mm -hmm. You can help a wider segment, including those who are not quite ready for the highest level thing yet, but they still want to be educated. They still want to be informed. They still want to learn from you. They still want to start the journey with you and they don't want it to be all or nothing. It's very frustrating as an entrepreneur when what you have to offer is an all or nothing scenario right so it's just it's just big ticket high ticket items there's no kind of there's no sort of uh courting period if you like yeah yeah i mean you put that beautifully there's no courting period and actually courting is nice for everyone <laughs> because then by the time people come to invest in your highest ticket things, which there'll always be an occasional unicorn who just wants to go from, I just met you to I want your mm -hmm. highest level thing. Yeah. I, I want you to build me like a 10 million pound house. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to, you know, do the designs for the 10 million pound house. Um, but that's rare. Most people, yeah. they want to go on a journey with you and it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, that's a lovely way of putting it, actually going on a journey with somebody and in and most definitely you know we see this in the architecture industry where there's this kind of you know if we imagine it like a triangle at the very tip of the triangle maybe there's three five percent of clients who are actually ready to purchase a high ticket offer now with you know for an architectural services a full package yeah. of architectural services for this 10 million pound house for example yeah. but underneath that there's people who are interested or thinking about a new home or they don't know how to start and then beneath that there's people who have who've got pinterest boards and it's a kind of fantasy yeah. but they have the means and you want to be able to kind of communicate with you know that 90 percent really that's beneath the the top tip so mm. that it's, as you say you can go on a journey with them Exactly. And also one of the benefits as well is that then when people are engaging with your higher level offers and your higher level services, they're more educated, they're more informed, they're not asking stupid questions. Yeah. <laughs> Which can be really frustrating for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you, it helps you avoid that as well. So with with a kind of lack of clarity in in messaging and, you know, kind of an over dependence on technical parlance if you like mm. what you know that, so that's some of the kind of things we see the businesses doing what does that do to their actual quality of you know quality of experience in their own businesses for themselves and for their clients what yeah, kind of it can massively it, it can massively impact your confidence as right. a business owner because clarity equals confidence Lack of right. clarity equals insecurity. Right. So if your value proposition, if your elevator pitch, if your messaging is overly complicated or not clear enough, not concise enough, you are more likely to feel like an imposter. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to feel like you don't deserve the kind of clients that you really, really want to work with and want to attract. Mm -hmm. and you're more likely to discount you're more right. likely to not have healthy boundaries when it comes to clients being ridiculous which <laughs> everyone has clients being ridiculous at times right it just it's an inevitability there's ways to 
reduce the risk of it, reduce the incidence of it so that it becomes, you know, a very occasional thing. But I don't right. know a single business owner who hasn't had a client being ridiculous at some point during their, <laughs> their business journey. Um, but you're less likely to, to deal with those kind of situations powerfully because you don't feel as secure in yourself. You don't feel as solid in yourself. And you almost end up feeling like you've won the lottery <laughs> when someone mm -hmm. becomes a client. Yeah. Like you're the one that's the privileged one mm -hmm. versus understanding when you're really solid in your messaging and you're really solid in your brand, you understand it's a win-win for both. Yeah. So they're lucky to get to work with you, to get to leverage your expertise, to get to get to where they want to go uh, more easily, with more certainty, with more security, with more conviction, because they're leveraging your expertise. And you're lucky because you get to serve them. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to get to serve the right clients. Mm -hmm. So it does have a big impact. Wow. I mean, that's, I love the way you've, you've, you've described that, you know, this kind of insecurity of actually working with a client where, you know, this, this seesaw, if you like, the roller coaster of emotion that goes with, you know, it's kind of neediness and insecurity. Yeah. And not feeling worthy or deserving. And also the, the kind of conflict of wanting that sort of project and all these sorts of clients to be working yeah. with and then finally getting into a conversation with them and you know then doing the dog and pony show to try and impress and you know it's the sort of if you use the dating analogy it's like a guy trying to you know shower you with gifts and take you for dinner or with some unrealistic expectation of getting married in the next couple of weeks or whatever yeah it's yeah. It, it it doesn't it doesn't work and it weirds the other person out there's a sort of energetic imbalance if you like and exactly you know we, we see this kind of happen all the time and then as you're saying actually winning a client like that then you're still feeling unworthy and then now you're vulnerable to you know you're going to jump through every single hoop and you know which doesn't serve you and if it doesn't serve you it's not going to serve the client absolutely and actually it's a really easy way to attract um quite narcissistic clients as well who will just want to take advantage because mm. the kind of people who see that vulnerability and go oh i see that vulnerability and i and i want it i like that that person feels weak i want to i want them to to serve me because i know that if they're weak they're easier to manipulate right you're much more likely to attract narcissistic clients who will just treat you like rubbish as well so whereas Ooh. whereas like you said like healthy people mm -hmm just go whoa you're trying too hard i don't like this i'm off right yeah but narcissists are like yes mm. <laughs> give me um, great okay so avoiding narcissistic clients i mean that's this this is fascinating right already mm. you know that the the power of our messaging or the lack of power in our messaging actually leaves us vulnerable for people who you know maybe they're not conscious of doing it but they're the kind of person who are unconsciously which is probably even worse if you like yeah. who are you know taking advantage of of you and wanting to manipulate you and yeah. our own messaging is is attracting them mm -hmm. right got it okay what's the, what's the kind of desired solution then or the desired outcome what kind of messaging do we want to have or what do what's the outcomes that we want to have from the right kind of messaging and then we can talk yeah. about the actual you know principles behind uh, how to create that yeah yeah we want to have messaging that's clear that's concise mm -hmm. that speaks to your absolute ideal clients mm -hmm. doesn't just speak to the average person right there's this very 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 common fear amidst business owners i even went through it myself i've helped many many clients work through this fear in terms of their own mindset there's a fear that if you speak and zero in on your exact ideal client you're yeah. narrowing your options and that you're hardly going to get any leads. You're going to hardly get any interest because you're being too specific. Mm -hmm. Now I'm sure there are examples that exist where that is possible. Like if you said that you were selling potatoes <laughs> purely to people with a vitamin d deficiency who lived on jolly road 
in Peterborough. <laughs> right? But then you yeah. might have a problem. <laughs> you make out of business quite quickly, right? <laughs> So, of course, uh, we want to strike the balance well. Yeah. But in the most part, when you really zero in, I'm, I'm so <laughs> pleased that that tickled you so much. <laughs> uh, I'm going to use that myself. That's so good. Um, so, but in the most part, when you really zero in on your ideal client, okay, what kind mm -hmm. of projects do they want to create? What kind of value range do they have? Um what are their values like what's important to them in terms of the project are they mm -hmm. you know people who really value um simple um functional uh minimalist projects for example right mm -hmm. um what actually happens is that your ideal clients see that and go oh my gosh this is exactly what I want. I want someone who mm -hmm. specializes or I want a, a, a firm that specializes in this, in this size of project, this type of project with this kind of aesthetic. So this is, this is absolutely my person. I need to get on the phone with him or her straight away yep. and have a conversation about my specific project. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's, there's very natural fear that comes up around that. But it is normally, as long as you're doing it and you're doing it well and you're consistent with the messaging, it will be incredibly fruitful for you. So I'm, I'm going to assume then as well that a complete absence of messaging, because a lot of architects, for example, they're going to, you know, they will they will run their business with very little marketing and sales. Yeah, you know, just pictures, and, right? <laughs> yeah, ju well, yeah, just pictures and and or not very much active prospecting yeah. or business development and it just all happens as referrals and then you'll hear the common dictum in architecture where people will say well we just focus on doing great work and then you know that's how it, it's okay fair enough that's that is the most base level of marketing you can do is just not fucking up a job all yeah. right fair enough yeah okay but it's not that that that's like in the absence of actually putting out a message um you're only ever going to attract what more of what you've already got and if it's not what you w already want then that's a problem mm -hmm. and so i'm assuming then if just a complete absence of messaging is also mm -hmm. going to leave us vulnerable to attracting these kinds of narcissistic manipulative mm -hmm. kinds of clients and leads to them or, or just plain wrong fit clients right worst case scenario is that they're narcissistic manipulative horrible to work with don't pay don't pay on time constantly mm -hmm. complain but while also giving you amb ambiguous instructions <laughs> aren't committed to giving you the information that you need, right? That's like worst case scenario. And then, but there's, there's a whole spectrum of, of other painful, annoying scenarios that can be encountered that can be avoided through getting your messaging right, through getting your onboarding right. And you spoke to their customer service and, and customer service is great. And customer service is an important part of your brand and having mm -hmm. good customer service will absolutely elevate and reinforce your brand, but it's never ever a substitute for marketing. Marketing is a proactive activity of clarifying your proposition, making it clear who you're for, and continually um, creating pieces of content and lead generating activity that brings and magnetizes people in versus sitting there passively going, okay, well, we're going to focus on great customer service and they're just going to come. That's not how it works. Yes. As you said, people will still make referrals, but just because somebody's a good client doesn't mean they'll make a good referral. And if your messaging is mm. ambiguous, potentially you're going to have clients making referrals who aren't people you want to work with, but then because they've come from the client that you've got, that you like, that you want to hold on to, you're like, okay, well, I'll help your friend, Billy, who wants to build a shed in his garden because you don't want to upset your client, but you don't want to be building architectural plans for somebody's shed. Like that's not your thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you also, one of the things that I help people with as well is making sure that you are really clear with your existing clients what a good referral looks like. Mm -hmm. 
So you send regular communications to your clients. This can be on the phone. This can be via email. I, I recommend that it's not automated um, because automated stuff in general, just, you know, if it's an existing relationship, it, it can be repelling. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, letting your current clients know, hey, do you know someone who is looking to achieve X? You know, who has a project of this size, they're looking to achieve X. If you make a referral uh, and they become a client, we would love to give you Y, right? So you always want to incentivize it. Could be, we'd love to give you a Fortnum and Mason hamper. It could be, we'd love to take you out for dinner at the Shard. Or it could be a credit against future services with you, whatever it is. But when you send that clear communication to existing clients, they that's when they will make great referrals. Brilliant. And you won't get any referrals for sheds for Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. So so really what we're looking at is that having very clear messaging leads to an extraordinary level of confidence in who it is that you that you want and your and you know who you are in the world. We're starting to attract the right fit clients, the ones that we want, the ones who are going to pay on time, the ones who are going to bring us the, the best types of caliber of projects. And overall, everything else in the business is going to start to improve when we get that part correct. Definitely. So, so let's look at some of the, the kind of ideas here about what creates strong, clear messaging. And mm -hmm. the idea that we were kind of discussing at the very outset is, is polarity. So what is mm -hmm. polarity in messaging? Yeah, so polarity is really interesting. I started studying it actively last year. Mm -hmm. And I started studying, you know, polarized communication. And polarized communication is basically as women communicating in a feminine way and mm -hmm. men communicating in a masculine way oh and so how i apply this to personal brands mm -hmm. right this, this applies a little bit less to corporate brands right if you've got a massive firm it's a little bit less mm -hmm. applicable um with massive firms they're naturally going to lean towards very masculine communication with a smaller right. firm if your firm is run by a woman and this has mm -hmm. absolutely, I want to be absolutely clear, this has nothing to do with sexism. <laughs> okay. Absolutely nothing to do with sexism. Men and women are perfectly equal. Mm -hmm. It's just literally acknowledging energetically that on an energetic level, women tend to resonate more from a marketing perspective when they use feminine communication which includes feminine messaging mm -hmm. and men tend to resonate and magnetize more readily when they use masculine communication so that's what it is right so what so so how are we going to define feminine and masculine what do these what do these terms mean so feminine is uh more light more loving more mm -hmm. playful more joyful more flowing and mm -hmm. so this can be represented in your brand imagery right your, right. your brand design any brand photography uh, if you've got an about page where you've got you know a bio and pictures of you you don't want to be and you're a woman you don't want to be sat there with your arms crossed right wearing a suit you want to have a picture of of for example you as a woman wearing a lovely flowing dress in nature for example <laughs> right smiling right. um that's a very rudimentary example but also in your in your messaging and in your content there'll just be subtle differences in how you communicate and this also translates to the sales process as well so things like being a bit more permissive so uh one of the changes that i made in my brand last year is instead of just putting out posts where I said, do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would say, someone needs to hear this today. Right. So there's not an underlying assumption that I'm giving them and giving everyone an instruction. Mm -hmm. It's a, someone needs to hear this today. And then it's a thing that they might want to consider. 
Mm -hmm. So let me give you a, a, an architectural example to really bring this to life. Someone needs to hear this today. If you hire the wrong architect, it can make or break your project. Mm -hmm. If you want to hire an architect you can rely on, I invite you to send me a message. Mm -hmm. That's feminine communication. Right. Because it's a bit softer. You're yeah. inviting, you're not making sort of universal sweeping statements. You're not coming across in a, you're, you're coming across as authoritative without coming across as dominant. Mm -hmm. And that will tend to be more magnetic as a woman. If a woman on the other hand posted, if you hire the wrong architect for your project, you're screwed. Send me a message if you want to hire the right architect. For a very macho man, he mm -hmm. can get away with that because that's a masculine form of communication and he is a masculine being. Right. If a woman says that, people are going to be like, I'm off, <laughs> right? Delete. Bye-bye. Because they yeah. get triggered. So again, this is this is nothing to do with sex. Men and women completely equal, but it's acknowledging that energetically, when women engage in more feminine communication, including in marketing, it's more effective. When men engage in more masculine communication in their marketing, it's more effective. What's really interesting is where we've seen some, without getting too political, where we've seen some shifts in, in uh, it being more common for men to be feminized mm -hmm. at this point in society. There are many men who will use more feminine communication in their marketing and then wonder why they're attracting the wrong clients or why they're attracting clients who want to walk all over them or attracting, you know, mostly female clients when they actually want to be attracting uh, either male clients or a combination of male and female clients, etc. So it's very, very interesting how it can translate into then the client attraction, but also your um, your experience of your business on the inside, right? This all it's about reverse engineering what works. So how? you know in terms of authentic like it being authentic or the words being and i and i also get, get that like you're saying some people are more comfortable using certain ways of communicating and have maybe have, have learned that um so from the from the perception of the other how does the other person know i mean certainly in today's culture like well who's who's a man who's a woman or or is it you know if if you're because you've got to be pers being perceived as a masculine man in the first place in order for there to be feminine and if there's a feminine communication coming from you then right. that is that's the thing that, that's that's going to be not aligned is that the idea yeah so uh, let me give an example so let's say that you are a man and you're actually not very masculine at all you're mm -hmm. quite energetically right energetically you're quite kind of gender neutral like you kind of oscillate between a little bit of masculine uh, <laughs> energy and a little bit of feminine energy, right? Which is which yeah. is increasingly common in our modern society mm -hmm. is that women have a mixture of masculine and feminine energy and uh, men have a mixture of masculine and feminine energy. And it actually does create a lot of conflict because it's not how we were designed. We were designed that men are meant to be mostly in their masculine energy. And there's a small minority of situations where it's more effective for them to sort of go into a more feminine energy. And women are designed to spend more time in feminine energy. Mm -hmm. So if your brand imagery is uh, masculine, there's going to be an assumption that the energy that your marketing is also going to embody and project would also be masculine. So then mm -hmm. if it comes through as feminine, it does two things. It creates a discordance, it creates mm -hmm. a, a sense of lack of cohesiveness, which makes your, your brand magnet weaker. Mm -hmm. But also if you have um, 
a masculine man with very feminine marketing, he is more likely to attract only female clients. Right. Because the female clients go, oh, that's feminine communication. <laughs> oh, I like that. It doesn't feel too jarring. Right. So, 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 the, well, this becomes interesting then, say we're in sales conversations and we are dealing with some, somebody of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. Do we need to be then adjusting our communication styles so that, yeah, you know, if I'm, selling, if I'm selling to a man, then I can be more directive and kind of assertive. And if I'm dealing with a woman, then I need to be more feminine or it depends more, on or, your or gender. The opposite way around. Right. Okay. So it depends on your gender as well as their gender. Okay. So if you're a man talking to a man, if you're a man mm -hmm. talking to a male client, using hyper masculine communication can be really, mm -hmm. really effective. If yeah, you're a okay. woman talking to a female client, using hyper feminine communication can be really effective. If right. you're a woman talking to a male client, you want to kind of meet somewhere in the middle, right? So right. it's very, very interesting. But what what I've noticed is when people are when people lack the ability to, in the sales conversation specifically, when they lack the ability to kind of shuffle a little bit here or there, mm -hmm. that's when then people find themselves with, oh, hang on, 90% of my clients are male or 90% of my clients are female. Yeah. When people have mastered this, both in their marketing, knowing how to um speak in a way that is aligned with uh you know feminine or masculine communication but also when they're able to um, leverage this in the sales conversation they're more likely to have a mixture of clients so they're more mm -hmm. likely to end up with like a 50 50 split where they have 50 percent female clients 50 percent male clients now this does also apply to corporate clients as well because obviously corporations have their own identity as well. And corporations tend to be either more masculine or more feminine. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a mixture of like very, very male dominated, um, hyper results focused, everything needs to be done yesterday, <laughs> right? Yeah. Clients. And then clients who are more more flowing, more flexible, more creative, more dynamic. Again, that actually can speak really powerfully to your ability to to navigate both masculine and feminine communication. But if it's right. a personal brand, if it's a personal brand, i.e., you are the brand, you are the figurehead of the business, you want your messaging to align with your gender. So, so, let, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit as well. And also kind of just make the distinction between the brand of a business versus the brand, the personal yes. brand. This is not yes. always clear. And I, and I think it's really interesting because all successful businesses have two brands. They've got the personal brand of the CEO and the yes. person running yeah. it. You yeah. look at Steve Jobs and Apple, you look at oh, and Tim Cook now, or you look at Tesla and Elon Musk as, you know, the, as classic examples. Yeah. But we, we all have our own personal brand and then the band, brand of our, our business. So they've got, they've got different styles genders communications and also yeah. now we're talking about what the gender is of the person who's communicating yeah and that and then i suppose this is this would open up into another conversation or what what is gender and obviously there's so much talk about yeah you know people not being the i mean look this is not my my area we won't go down that rabbit hole today <laughs> 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 and there being you know being a, com a conversation around well what is what is gender anyway and some people f um feeling like well you know how i feel is not aligned with what my body is and then so that's going to kind of have a, a disjunct of communication as well with, with another person if you look a certain way then i'm going to be expecting you to be communicating in a masculine way yes. and now you're not yes Yes, can definitely create, obviously, I mean, that that whole situation can create a lot of confusion for the individual, but also mm -hmm. from a brand perspective, um, can create a lot of confusion and conflict as well.
yeah right okay okay so so the difference between personal brand and business brand let's start there and then yeah we'll so personal the... brand is uh and and your brand might be purely a personal brand so if the name of your company is your name and you're the figurehead and you're front and center and everyone else is operating underneath you you have your personal brand as the ceo as you said ryan but also the the brand is a personal brand as well right so that's what i'm talking about when i say a personal brand from that perspective uh, a corporate brand is a brand that you have created to represent the the culture the mission the identity of a company and is something that can be sold in the future right you can mm -hmm. sell a corporate brand you can't sell a personal brand you can you can sell a company that's operating underneath a personal brand and someone else can run it or they can rename it mm -hmm. um yeah so that's the difference which, which is more important these days i personally um i'm a little bit biased because my brand is a personal brand and most of my clients brands are personal brands Mm -hmm. um, I think there's absolutely a time and a place for both, mm -hmm. but I think there's a different level of magnetism when the brand is yours and the brand either has your name as part of it or your name, mm -hmm. certainly your name front and center. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is that humans really like to hire other humans. Yeah humans have more of a preference a natural preference to hire other humans than to hire some mystical entity that mm -hmm. has a name. Yep. Um, and so you obviously can achieve the best of both worlds if you have a corporate name, but then your faces as, as, as a, your face as a founder or your faces as co-founders are, are very much front and center and your personal story and your personal mission is front of front and center, you can achieve the best of both worlds with that. Um, mm -hmm. And there is a specific area of the brain called the fusiform face area that lights mm -hmm. up when human beings see faces. Mm -hmm. And so whichever type of brand, whether it's a personal brand or a corporate brand, having your face as much as if you've never done it before, it might be scary and you might want to remain invisible and, you might think that that's cool and sexy. It, it, it's really not. <laughs> you want to have yeah. your face. Well, your this is this, this is very interesting. I mean, like as uh, architects classically will try and remove any evidence of of humans being either exactly. in their work exactly. and in the building pictures and on their websites, and we'll see yeah. these very kind of clean, uh, sleek, minimalist websites with a sexy looking bit of logo or title, and yeah. then you know you you don't know who it is, and actually putting a face or faces it yeah. becomes it just totally changes the dynamic and yeah and the way that it's being communicated and how people are relating to it and that and yeah, just, i find it... there's a different level of trust as well there's different yeah. level of connect of connection and there's a different level of trust because they go oh you're a human being and especially if if they've had any kind of personal relationship with you in the past mm -hmm. or any kind of professional connection with you in the past um, which if you're leveraging your network properly, you should be regularly having clients come through who have been personal connections in the past or have been professional connections in the past, whether they're previous clients or clients that you served through a different entity previously. Um, there's just a totally different level of trust because they immediately go, oh, I know him. Great. Okay. So, so now coming back to the, the idea of the personal brand and communicating a, a kind of with some kind of gender alignment to how you're being perceived yeah. and then the the energy with which you're communicating yeah um like how how, do, how can people kind of start to dig into that and become congruent if you like it's mm. a good question so you want to reflect for yourself at the moment in this current moment are you resonating more with male clients or female clients. Right. And if there's an imbalance, mm -hmm. you want to look at what do I need to do to redress that balance? Right. So actually when we're, when we're looking at the kind of ideal 
avatar client that we want that gender is actually quite an important part to consider it is definitely it is and i know it's not it might not be like politically correct to say that <laughs> yeah but it is an energetic truth that it right. plays a factor energetically mm -hmm. in the dynamic in the marketing process in the sales conversation it plays a role and so if we can have that in mind if we can be conscious of that mm -hmm. we are going to attract and convert those clients more easily it's that simple mm -hmm. it's not a political conversation at all right so it, I, I again i find it interesting with what you were saying about the kind of a woman acting masculine if you like and obviously yeah. this is a kind of a, like a maybe perhaps a, a cliched uh, a, a cliched idea of of a woman in corporate life yeah who's had to adopt a lot of masculine traits in order to to kind of succeed mm -hmm. is that is that cliched truth or is it kind of or, it's absolutely or... a thing that there are many women in the world who embody that and when a woman and i and i've coached many women who've been mm -hmm. in that space and i would say that me eight nine years ago was mm -hmm. a little bit more in that space yeah uh i wasn't you know because we can think about it as a spectrum right mm -hmm. and on this side you've got like absolute ball breaking like just <laughs> intolerable um person to be around and then on this side we've got like super feminine and flowy and, and flexible and receptive and soft and like oh yeah okay no problem whatever you want to do right um <laughs> and so i was sort of a little bit more towards this side like seven eight mm -hmm. years ago before i started my coaching training before i started understanding energy before i started you know, optimizing my own ways of communicating and operating and functioning and helping others do the same. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's two things really. One is a woman being in a very masculine uh, mode of leading and communicating is normally a trauma response mm -hmm. where something has happened either in her personal life or professionally that's made her feel unsafe to be a woman. And so then she decides in her subconscious mind and often in her conscious mind as well, it's not safe for me to be a woman. So I have to act like a man or I mm -hmm. won't be safe. And she starts doing this, not realizing that it not only will deplete her energetically, because again, we're talking here about what works energetically. There's no judgment of right or wrong morally or any politics or anything like that. It's just what works energetically. So not only will she feel drained, but also she's more likely to repel the exact clients and opportunities that she most wants. And instead, she will attract the kind of clients and opportunities who want her to continue to function like a man, mm -hmm. who want her to continue to be a ball breaker mm -hmm. and are likely going to be very hard work to deal with because the people that are drawn to that, there tends to be something missing in themselves. Like they're too soft or they're too um, malleable or they're mm -hmm. too, uh, like literally can't be bothered. So they're like, well, I'm going to hire her because she's going to compensate for my weaknesses. And right. we never want, and I know this is really, really deep, but we never want an ideal client to be hiring from this person's going to compensate for my weaknesses. We want a client to be hiring us because they go, I need this person's expertise and I like this person and their energy feels good and our values match. Well, hold on a minute. Okay, so th th this is very interesting. So it's really we, don't, deep. We, we, we don't want clients hiring us out of their own sense of lack. Exactly. Basically. exactly. We want them hiring us because they see it as being uh, like a powerful mix or powerful yes. compliment. Yes. 
Right. Because any client who hires us from like, well, I've got this thing lacking and, and mm -hmm. not, not just like a, like a pocket of knowledge, right? But like, I've got this thing lacking in me. And this very often happens on a totally unconscious level, <clears throat> right? Which is why mm -hmm. all of my psychology experience and expertise and stuff is, is integral to this and comes in really useful when I'm helping clients with this. Yeah. So it may be completely unconscious to the client. But what will happen is when they're hiring you from a place of I'm not enough in this, so I'm going to hire my opposite. Mm -hmm. There's always drama that will unfold. Right. <laughs> there's always drama right. that will unfold. There's always unhappiness and conflict and like nothing you ever do will be enough. Mm hmm because they're trying to use you to fill a void in them that you weren't designed to fill. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, so this is very interesting. So if, if you are somebody with clients who you feel are kind of quite exhausting and depleting to you, yeah. when the, one of the first things to be looking at is an inquiry over the congruence of our messaging and what we're putting out and perhaps yes. we've found uh, like a false mask that we're yes that we've put on and we're kind of pretending to be something yes. and now now we've got to keep up the pretense yes and and the, the actual keeping up of the pretense is exhausting yes it's exhausting and it depletes the strength of our magnet mm-hmm right got it and the magnet becomes like ineffective and mm -hmm. um like almost like drunk like the magnet becomes drunk if we're not being and th and this is why one of the key things that i do is to help clients become more authentically them mm -hmm. and why the executive coaching piece and the performance coaching piece is so important because if we're not being the authentic us, the magnet is literally drunk mm -hmm. and we'll just like be attracting like total randoms, right? Versus when we're authentically us, we're authentically us in terms of our own essence, in terms of our own communication, in terms of our own leadership and in terms of our messaging and our sales process, that magnet becomes like 99.9% .9 foolproof. And it will be mm -hmm. so rare that someone comes through who's a nightmare client or a wrong fit or whatever. And if they do even make an inquiry, you'll be able to filter them out really, really quickly because you've got mm -hmm. the proper processes in place to filter out the wrong people and become even more compelling to the right people. So how do we accommodate then uh, like personal preferences and personality preferences and yeah. desires for, you know, to, to be like self-expression and perhaps your self-expression doesn't align with a, a preconceived idea of what masculinity is. And you're a man, for example, right? Say you're a man, you identify as a man and actually you're a bit, you know, the way that you feel comfortable the most communicating is more, feminine your certainly like say in the world of design right there's, there's loads of very creative yeah. men right design music um and you know even even myself i might i would, would kind of say well there's certainly lots of feminine things that i enjoy or commun enjoy communicating like how do how do i how do you start to distinguish between what's authentic what's pretense mm -hmm. and and also um, creating something that's going to be impactful and magnetic to attract the right sorts of people for you. How do we, how do we walk this fine, fine line balance? And that's why I think I say that polarity is, is one factor to be aware of. And it's right. a really game changing factor to be aware of. But as you very aptly pointed out, if your authentic essence as a man, your genuine authentic essence as a man is that you communicate in a slightly more you know creative fluffy um <laughs> effectively feminine kind of way mm -hmm. we don't want to completely abandon that and go in the opposite direction because then we'd be creating messaging and creating a brand 
that whilst it's, you know, polarised, it's also inauthentic. Yeah. So we do want to do that dance in the right mm-hmm. way. I, I think this is re- this is really, really fascinating. And, and um, you know, just it, it kind of being engaged in a conversation around like, well, what is masculinity? What is masculinity for you? Or what is femininity for you? And, you know, we can look at archetypes as well, arch- like, yes. you know, kind of Jungian archetypes of each sex. And with, and this is why the whole, the, the kind of the, 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 the gender conversation at the moment is, is interesting because, well, already, you know, what exists in pre, you know, in predefined male, female is a massive spectrum anyway. Yes, definitely. Of yeah. like, of predefined archetypes or archetypes that you could find yourself that, that to fit in, you know, mm-hmm. on, on a male, archetype you've got the kind of classic warrior type of image and strong man and then on the other side of it you've got the lover or like a kind of you know the more of like a rock star kind of person which is still very masculine yeah but you know if you think of someone like i think of someone like prince or mick jagger yeah. who yeah. are like borderline kind of certainly in their in their youth were kind of borderline androgynous but they were still very masculine and it was a very sexual energy that was being communicated that was very masculine but it was it was its masculinity was confident enough to to like flirt with the other side if you like yes it's it's very very interesting it's very very interesting and yeah it's it's a useful thing to be aware of it's a really useful thing to be aware of because as much as there is room to play, mm-hmm. if a man is too much, in, in, is engaging in, in feminine messaging to too much of a degree, mm-hmm. he will attract clients who are going to be a nightmare to work with, who are going to be um, needy. Right. They're going to be uncertain Mm -hmm. right they're going to lack certainty they're going to lack clarity they're going to be needy they're going to need a lot of reassurance a lot of emotional reassurance Mm -hmm. because that's just how it works yeah and so we just want to be aware of it so we say okay right you know if if this if this person if this architect uh sits more in as you said kind of like the lover archetype Mm -hmm. and so there's a bit more creativity present there's there's more nuances present Mm -hmm. and there's like an appreciation for uh aesthetics in in an even deeper way right we want to own that we want to incorporate that into the brand Mm -hmm. and still have uh important aspects of the messaging be very directive still have important aspects of the messaging be dominant be owning Mm -hmm. his authority be owning his expertise be saying Mm -hmm. you know if you found this article useful contact me i can't wait Mm -hmm. to hear from you yeah right versus what the unhealthy version of that would look like that would diminish the magnet would be like you know um sharing a whole bunch of expertise in a piece of content Mm -hmm. and then being like hope you found this useful yeah. Well, Especially. again, this, 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 <laughs> well, this is very interesting. And uh, again, I use use the kind of examples of like a Mick Jagger or a Prince. Yeah. You watch them in an interview, for example, and okay, there's like an, there's a, a visual androgynous artistic shell, if you like, but then the masculine energy is very like what you're talking about. It's super direct. Exactly. Super, and remember, super, like, there's boom. also a really important distinction here around entertainment. Like Mm -hmm. what people find compelling from an entertainment perspective. Mm. Like I'm paying for this ticket because I want to be entertained by you. Yeah. Is very different to a professional services relationship. Right. Interesting. So just because certain things have worked with certain celebrities in the past in terms of Mm -hmm. their brand magnetism, this is a very different segment of the market that we're talking about here. Right. Like I want to pay you for your, for your high ticket services is totally mm-hmm. different than I want to be entertained by you. Yeah. Got it. 
I love it. I love it. I want to drink I, I, half what, a bottle of wine and listen to you. <laughs> what, 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 well, what's interesting here is, I mean, it kind of opens up a very nice um, inquiry for people to explore their own, you know, masculinity and femininity. Yeah. And like, it's not, it's not really anything to do with identity at all. It's like, you know, there is an energy here yeah. that can yeah. be congruent and that you can utilize. Why wouldn't you want to utilize it? And actually in you know em embracing certain types of energy actually might be really really fulfilling and enjoyable exactly and what i've noticed is that this does tend to become really enjoyable for people yeah. because it feels better to you like most mm -hmm. of the things that are more effective from a brand magnetism perspective are also the things that actually feel better to you as the business mm -hmm. owner. You feel more cohesive. You feel more in harmony. You're like, oh, now I understand why all these conversations didn't go well in the past and why now I never have any conflict in any of my sales conversations or any of my client relationship conversations. I understand that completely now because of this. Right. So again, it's, it, it's no judgment behind it. It's just it's just about what works. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to touch on was um, with celebrities specifically, sometimes part of what we find captivating with celebrities mm -hmm. is that they're total contradictions. Right. Like they're completely misaligned in this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then they're incredible in this way. Right. And that can work in that specific area, in that specific industry. But if someone experiences that again in a professional services setting, they're like, this doesn't match. This makes me suspicious of you. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it is, it's a totally different context because say in, in the idea, like you say, in, in the idea of an entertainment or, you know, going to see a rock star on stage, there's an element of, complete fantasy and why we're attracted to the person or want to see them entertaining because they're living a completely fan fantasical fantastical life it's a yeah. rock star life it's, that's it's yeah. like it is it's something different it's something you know that's why it's up on stage being being entertained and showed off because it's yeah. it's like the peacock if you like yeah brilliant amazing amazing jamie really really fascinating conversation here and i'm sure this is gonna uh tickle Hopefully a few people's people. brains aren't exploding and, and, and people, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people kind of having a, a lot more questions and even kind of absolute no oh, that's not the way it is or you know i i think it's you know in today's culture uh to have a a, a conversation around masculinity and feminine and femininity and embracing them and and also celebrating the richness of yeah. of like what it is to be a man or what it is to be a woman um and you know that's a, it's a very it's a it's a conversation with a lot of uh delicacy that's required yeah. and there's too much there's a lot of kind of you can't say this you can't do that and you know jumping on different ideologies very quickly so i i, I appreciate your contributions today i think that's been a really fascinating conversation um, and I look forward to speaking to you again. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And yeah, just to touch briefly on the, on the, on the sales conversation aspect, mm -hmm. again, it's just, okay. As a, as a woman, does it feel better for you to be like pushy and this is what you must do, or does it feel better in the sales conversation? to be more exploring, to be getting to the root of what's important to the potential client, exploring that, validating their feelings, validating their concerns, and then having the client almost sell themselves at the end of that conversation because they feel so seen and heard and understood, mm -hmm. right? I would yeah. argue that actually whatever your gender, that approach to selling is going to be more effective but there is a particularly antagonistic effect that a woman being in that former state of being will have with potential clients 
that will not be as antagonistic for people if it's a man. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just a fact. And so Brilliant. again, just just things to consider. Amazing. Amazing. Jamie, thank you so much for today's thank conversation. You. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.